is AEDT 1170U, Psychological Foundations and Digital Technologies, Module 9, Video Clip 9.1, The Impact of Social Media. In this module, we will examine the general features of social media that have a direct impact on human conditions of living and learning. The 21st century explosion of social networks and computer-mediated communication systems has profoundly changed how we interact as human beings. You only have to ask yourself, how would your life be different without your cell phone, without text messaging, without Facebook? In this module, we will examine how this ever-present social media has both simplified and complicated our lives. Here are the guiding questions for this video. Brainstorm the types of social networking systems that you are aware of and their intended uses. Describe some of the advantages and disadvantages of social media use. How has social media complicated or simplified your life? What features of social media are particularly useful for adult learners? And how has your use of social media affected your work or educational environment? So, this is you, and this is your friend Frank. Say you talk about this and that, and somebody writes it down, and somebody else reads it. Will it mean to them what it means to you? <laughs> nope. You determine meaning by the words and gestures, the content, and also what you know about him and what he knows about you and what you've discussed in the past, your relationship. And conversations are two-way interactions. Reading the content later isn't like participating. In the previous couple of hundred years, we got good at duplicating content. Well, big businesses and governments did mainly. We made copies of this and these and broadcasts of that and those. And this, lots of this. Then we started buying records and tapes and discs and built our own piles of content. Meanwhile, conversations stayed one-to-one, -one, even with telephones. In a way, content and conversation compete. You can talk with Frank about this or that, or you can read a book about this or watch a show about that. But they don't relate to you or interact with you. Well. Then we created the biggest content duplicating system ever. Computers, wireless, internet, the whole digital thing. But digital is different in three key ways. Information flows both directions. Content is available now, on demand. No broadcasts, no physical disks, and copies are perfect and cheap. Digital media has gotten so cheap that individuals, you and I, can duplicate and distribute our own content. Words, pictures, games, videos and more. Computers and smartphones can create, capture and copy all of it basically for free. So back to you and Frank talking about this. If you converse online and decide to share the words, images and whatever with people, it's more than just content to them. They can connect the content to the person. They can communicate back to you and participate in the conversation. Your content could lead to other content or to a new relationship. And the whole back and forth is becoming its own form of information and entertainment. That's what's happening. Someone decided to call it social media. But it's basically this huge, unpredictable worldwide network of conversations that's just exploding. They cover big topics like news and events and the little things that mass media missed. And all that mass media content is getting pulled into these conversations, sometimes legally, <laughs> sometimes not. We're getting more and more information and entertainment from each other. It's challenging and changing the duplicated content media world that worked for a couple of hundred years. You and Frank and your friends and their friends have always shared and conversed. Now you're having digital conversations that can be shared, saved, rated, scored, copied, cited, commented, forwarded, noted, quoted, voted, geocoded, sold, stolen, measured, treasured, linked, synced, syndicated, vindicated, printed, argued, searched and shared again. Starting new relationships or restarting old ones. People in groups, causes and companies, anyone can talk in any form. Anyone can listen. Anyone can relate to anyone else, worldwide. That's social media. Research examining online social networking is diverse. Mostly, this work has been directed to the social networking experiences of adolescents and young adults. However, older populations are increasingly using sites such as Facebook, and so research is beginning to look at how social networking affects older adults as well. 
The distinct and constant presence of social media in our lives has allowed us to make contact more often and in greater numbers than ever before. It's helped us to facilitate extended contact with online friends and acquaintances and become socially wired. But has this all been helpful or harmful? Let's take a look at social ties, the social network, and our internet. Consider that a social network is composed of a group of individuals who have something in common. This might be a friendship, an experience, a belief system, or some other type of relationship. Prior to the Facebook generation, these social networks were limited by geographical location or time zones. Today, these networks are no longer limited. They have intercultural, intergenerational, and a very global composition, and they connect us across time zones in an instant. We know from research on psychology that social networks can be a positive source of self-esteem, and this can greatly improve the quality of an individual's life. This positive consequence of a strong social network is known as social capital. Think on this. Now that your social network can extend anywhere in the world, and at any time 24 hours a day, what do you think are the psychological impacts on you? How has this increased your connectedness, and what quality of relationships exists within your network? Has it changed your workload, your personal relationships, and how much information is too much information? Here's a few more. What is your social capital like, and how do you measure it? Does your personality have an impact on the type of online social network you choose? And does your personality change between face-to-face -face social networks and online networks? I'm thinking of e-dating, e-shopping, e-gambling. Is what you see really what you get online? Social media and the workplace. Let's consider how we see social media being used in education and in the workplace. Many schools and workplaces have secure rules and regulations for how cell phone and social media are used. For example, the Ontario College of Teachers has designated guidelines for appropriate use of social media. Many companies have clear rules such as employees having to identify their views as personal and not corporate, not posting names, trademarks, logos, or other privileged company information. Often they cannot post photos or video of clients, cannot link to a company's internal website, and employers reserve the right to control site content. The difficulty arises when social media, used for personal reasons, crosses professional boundaries. So just where are those boundaries? These days, people have new powers. Not that kind. I mean on the web. We can create websites and post messages to the world with the click of a button. Blogs, social networking sites, and Twitter all make it easy. But this power comes with new responsibilities, especially when it comes to the workplace. Organizations often monitor what is said about them in the media and control every message that comes from the company. But these days, blogs and social networking sites mean that companies can't keep up. The media has become social. New ways to understand and react to what's being said online are now needed. That's why organizations are beginning to encourage employees to understand and be a part of online conversations. Whether it's a crisis like a defective chair model, everyday customer support, or just sharing information. The web is too wide for a company to control every communication. But a company can understand the growing influence of social media and create an environment where employees are empowered to participate and build trust with their customers. Let's do some more thinking on this. Do we each have biases in terms of how we see the usefulness of social networks? Are we beginning to see the advantages of it as a business tool? According to some companies, many executives will hear only the social in social media and think, what a recreational time waster. But social media has a place in the business world, and that place is much bigger than LinkedIn and extends far beyond the marketing department. Social media has many uses in the workplace, not the least of which is involving the public in marketing design and product placement. Here's what a few recent authors think. In his book, The Wisdom of Crowds, James Surowiecki argued that the public can be surprisingly smart. Social media can be used for feedback loops and innovation, including reaching beyond that corporate firewall to leverage the power of public opinion. In an article for Wired magazine, Jeff Howe coined the term crowdsourcing, the act of accessing the wise crowd for ideas and solutions. 
McAfee argued that new technologies are significant because they can knit together an enterprise and facilitate knowledge work in ways that were simply not possible previously. And finally, Shirky wrote, Here Comes Everybody. He referred to how social media are putting us in touch with people and ideas that we would otherwise be unlikely to ever encounter. Let's think of the ramifications of that last one. Brainstorm as many ways you can think of that would be positive or negative examples of mass dissemination of information through social media, things that have real human consequences. Some of the examples I might suggest, what about celebrity paparazzi woes, racist or hate-based literature, rumor mills, or even tsunami and natural disaster warnings that could be spread through social media. Clearly, social media is enabling the transmission of information to new kinds of online groups that can have a significant impact in the real world. Barack Obama's presidential campaign is an example of benefiting from this phenomenon. The sheer speed of transmission of information, or misinformation, shows us, number one, how much data is passed through social media, and two, how this change challenges us to be not only the consumers of information, but the critical consumers. We have to bring a filter to the world now that we did not need before social media entered our lives. What about social media and healthcare? Let's take a look at some of the newer frontiers in social media use. Can you see a role for social media in more effective healthcare? Imagine tweeting your doctor when you feel sick or going online for health information, never waiting in a doctor's office, but instead having your doctor available by the internet or Skype. Han wrote about this in her article, Take Two Aspirin and Tweet Me in the Morning. She discusses a private, secure social network that is the core medium through which patients of Hello Health physicians stay in touch with their patients. While this may seem like an efficient and cost-effective way to disperse health information, what about the more holistic models, the human skills of healthcare? Can these translate to your BlackBerry? Some other problems include growing concerns about guarding privacy of health information and the possibility of spreading inaccurate or problematic information. There may be legal issues as standards for this type of medical care and online advice do not yet exist. For doctors, using social media in healthcare is about changing the locus of control to the patient and changing the relationships between caregivers and care receivers. Would this open more doors for alternative medical practitioners, such as Chinese medicine? How about holistic or uncertified practitioners? Who is going to be regulating this online advice? These are just some of the concerns raised by some authors. Can you identify some others? Now let's examine how the power of collaboration works in social media use. It used to be conventional thinking that genius was born from individuals. While this still can occur, new research indicates that collaboration is a huge source of innovation and problem solving. This is where social media can have a tremendous influence if we learn to use it appropriately. Sawyer's work, Group Genius, the Creative Power of Collaboration, argues for this power of collaboration. He states that the collective power of ideas is incredible. From Darwin to the inventors of the ATM machine, innovation occurs in groups. Given how much faster we exchange ideas and data in social media, imagine how online groups can drive this type of progress forward. Tapscott and Williams agreed and wrote about this collaborative wealth of ideas in their work, Wikinomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything. Here are a few points to ponder. How would Darwin's work on evolution have changed if he could have texted his peers? What about Da Vinci or Newton or Mozart? What would their Facebook pages say? And what kind of impact did the recent WikiLeaks have on the world? Here are the synthesis questions for this video. We're going to discuss in tutorial this week how the use of social networking sites has had a direct impact on your life and work. Do you believe that social networking has a positive effect on adult social and psychological development? What dangers do you perceive in our dependence on social networking? Have social media experiences helped us to evolve or devolve? And fast forward brainstorm, can you predict some future areas not mentioned in this video where social networking might have an impact, either positive or negative, on the psychology of the human condition?